Today, Governor Lowe and the Reserve Board met and they kept the cash rate on hold, as we all know they will be for the time being. Uh, it has been an interesting couple of months. We've obviously gone through March and April with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns around what was happening, and, and that caused a lot of pessimism and fear in the marketplace. Well, it is pleasing to see that Australians are now starting to return to what is our default position, which is one of optimism and hope for the future. Um, and it should be that way, because what better nation in the world to live in than Australia right now? Um, you're seeing what's happening around the world. You should be very thankful um, that you do live in this country. You should be thankful uh, that we have the money in the budget to be able to uh, invest in stimulus to keep our economy moving uh, during these health crises and, and economic crises as well. And that's part of what I wanted to share with you in this, uh, in this commentary today is really about you know, where do you sit? Do you sit as a glass half full or do you sit as glass half empty? Because it really is um, going to require the majority of people, our economy is going to require the majority of people who are going to be glass half full um, to see us through. And, and that will be the theme throughout my commentary here today. So let's look firstly uh, at what are the uh, what's going on globally. Uh, so according to the latest data out of CPB's World Trade Monitor, we saw world trade volumes fall by 1.4% um, over the month of March to be down 4.3% over the year. Uh, volumes shrunk in the first quarter by 2.5%. So world trade has obviously been impacted by, uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, turning our attentions to America, well, it's fair to say um, so far this hasn't been Donald Trump's year. Um, he has got a lot of issues on his, on his agenda right now. Obviously, the, the tragic and horrible death of George Floyd last week and now the current race riots that are going on over there, um, the fake news battle uh, that's starting to uh, evolve with Twitter in terms of calling out some of his, uh, his uh, alternative facts, as he likes to call them. Uh, then, obviously, his mismanagement um, and a tanking economy in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, being the world's uh, epicentre of the, of the virus uh, and all of the challenges associated with that. And then topping it all off, obviously, the challenges that he's having and the battles he's having with China on several fronts, uh, not, not the least the, uh, the challenges around what's happening in Hong Kong at the moment. So um, a very challenging time for the Trump administration. Um, and yet we are seeing obviously the central bank over there pouring trillions of dollars into stabilising the economy and also um, supporting the equity markets, um, which is one positive sign over there. But uh, in the lead up to the November elections, uh, Donald Trump uh, has a real battle on his hands in terms of uh, maintaining control in the US. Turning our attentions to China, um, you know, they've got to be congratulated if we trust their numbers um, for a for a population of over 1.3 billion people, uh, it is incredible in terms of how they have been able to avoid a second wave to date um, and how they are going about uh, restoring their economic activity. So we're seeing a lot of data coming out of China, which is really supporting that outputs are moving very close to pre-COVID-19 levels, which again are, are extraordinary numbers. Uh, they'll continue to put a bit more stimulus into their local economy um, as the, uh, the demand for their exports uh, continues to withdraw uh, during these times. Um, that said, uh, China can probably be pulled up. Uh, as they're not winning too many international friends at the moment with their strong language around defending um, trading partners and uh, their COVID-19 origins uh, investigations and also how they're managing uh, the Hong Kong territories um, is obviously disappointing for the prospects of democracy in the Hong Kong territory areas. Now that bodes uh, for a challenging uh, geopolitical environment moving into the second half of this year. Uh, and these new developments are certainly going to dampen um, economic growth and the prospects of that and also uh, impact on the, um, on the sentiment levels. Now the central banks are doing everything that they can to continue that stimulation but it certainly points to uh, a slower global growth um, as we see most of the developed countries come out of the restricted um, restrictions from the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's not, a, it's not necessarily a great news story um, across the global outlook. 
Um, but when we do turn our attentions back here to Australia, once again, it does cement the view, and we should trademark this, but we are truly the lucky country. Um, you are absolutely blessed to be living here. And so whilst the world has been fast approaching over 2 point, sorry, 6.2 million confirmed cases and over 370,000 deaths globally from this horrific um, health issue, um, the Australian population has managed to handle the pandemic very well thus far with a little over 100 deaths, so in extraordinary. Um, looking at those numbers in more detail, only 7,200 confirmed cases. Um, two thirds of those have been imported from overseas. And we, uh, at the time of recording this, um, we currently only have 103 deaths reported. So if we put that into context uh, for the standard flu seasons that we have coming through Australia in different times of the year, um, we see deaths in that range of hundreds or even you know, over a thousand on occasions with poor um, influenza coming through. So an extraordinary job for, for everyone who's been able to help flatten the curve. Um, and, all, and the impact has been obviously severe on our economy. So that is now the balancing act that we're seeing. Because um, make no mistake, we are definitely going to see an increase in um, infection rates. That's only natural as we open the economy. Uh, but we are really well positioned now in terms of setup with contact tracing and also with our ICU beds. Um, so we, we are ready uh, for those increases. So we, we've got to be remain calm and confident in regards to if we start seeing uh, those cases improve. It would be an amazing outcome if we didn't see those, uh, but we've got to be realistic about that because the economic impact has been severe, uh, to say the least, over 600,000 job losses. Um, and so as we emerge out of hibernation, um, we obviously will be looking at that in more detail at the moment. Now, um, we are still seeing mainstream media uh, be very uh, cautious or, or maybe even some would say negative um, in terms of their tones and the sentiment and the messaging that they're putting out to the public, uh, keeping a certain level of fear uh, for some. And that is, uh, whilst understood, um, it can be unproductive in terms of you know, building the confidence that we need. And so whenever I see information like that, I do go to the business leaders in Australia and I also go to the RBA in terms of looking at their data. So I look at the bank's data and I also look at what the RBA governor is saying uh, in regards to this time. And it's fair to say that there is certainly a level of cautious optimism and confidence is definitely returning. Now, by way of example, I want to read to you a short statement that was released by Dr Lowe um, at the Senate Standing Committee last week um, in regards to the COVID-19. So, let me just uh, bear with me as I, uh, as I talk you through this particular statement. The past three months have been extraordinary ones in the lives of our nation, and there has been unprecedented policy response. On the economic front, there has been very close coordination between monetary and fiscal policies, as there should be at times like this. As part of the RBA's contribution to dealing with the pandemic, we announced a comprehensive package in mid-March. The goal is to support the economy by keeping funding costs low and credit available, especially for small and medium-sized businesses. As banker to the Australian government, the Reserve Bank has also processed many billions of dollars in government assistance to households and businesses. We've also made sure that the payment system is working well and that banknote supply is maintained. And we have done this with around 90% of our staff working from home. The evidence so far is that our mid-March package is working as expected and is helping to build the necessary bridge to the recovery. The shape and timing of this recovery depends not only on when restrictions are lifted, but also on the confidence that Australians have about their own health and their finances. With the national health outcomes better than earlier feared, it is possible that the economic downturn will not be as severe as earlier thought. Much depends on how quickly confidence can be restored. But as the recovery gets underway, there will still be a shadow cast by the pandemic. As a country, we'll need to turn our minds as to how we move out of this shadow. A reform agenda that makes Australia a great place for business to expand, invest, innovate, and hire people would certainly help. 
For its part, the RBA will maintain its expansionary settings until progress is being made towards full employment and we are confident that inflation will be sustainably within the 2 to 3% target band. So that was Governor Lowe's message last week and it's consistent in the message statement that he's released today in terms of being more optimistic. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be glass half full. Um, that is the takeaway that I get from these leaders in terms of what they're telling us to do. Now, in terms of the talking points for the remainder of, of my opinion piece here, um, I want to cover off the government blunder, the equity markets, current spending, of course, employment levels, credit growth, private credit expenditure, um, consumer confidence, and take a deeper dive into the property market and also um, the economic and property clift uh, dialogue that's out there with those naysayers and doomsdayers. So starting off firstly with the, uh, the economic forecasting blunder, it, it'll go down in history as the biggest. I don't think it'll, there'll be any bigger of this. Unfortunately, Treasury uh, got their modelling wrong um, and that has led to potentially 3 million less people being on the job keeper package. That means that the job keeper package is only around 3.5 million, not the you know 6.5 million that was originally uh, forecast. And that's meant that the government hasn't had to borrow an extra $60 billion. So the, the cost of the job keeper package and all the stimulus that they're putting out there may no longer be that $130 billion as originally forecast. Um, it's only going to be $70 billion. Now, you can give them some leeway there in regards to the fact that obviously it was a difficult time to be forecasting. There was lots of information around there. But it's true to say that the government uh, has made that mistake um, and they, uh, they need to rectify it. Of course, that also means that, um, that there will be potentially some more money to go to, uh, but it is a del- delicate balancing act in terms of that type of stimulus and where you direct that stimulus. So we'll come back to that shortly uh, during this presentation. In terms of the equity market rebounds, um, it's, it has been quite extraordinary um, to think that, that basically that the overall equity markets are around only 3% off their peaks from last November. Um, extraordinary in regards to those sort of levels, uh, around 3 to 5%. What we are seeing in the equity markets, and this is giving me a little bit of confidence in the fact that, uh, that the average Joe public uh, thinks that the stock market's a good place for their money because there's no returns to be held anywhere else. Um, and their optimism is returning. They actually think that, uh, that we will get through this, which we will, um, and then on the other side of that, uh, those businesses will continue to improve and perform. Now, whether they're right or wrong, only time will tell, um, or whether this is a dead cat bounce um, in terms of, and it still remains a bear market, uh, is also going to come out in the next weeks and months ahead. That being said, um, it also is uh, also evidenced by the amount of money that has been pumped into uh, the equity markets as we currently stand. So um, there has been a strong bounce there and and that could be giving some people some confidence. So keep an eye on uh, those world equity markets and also the local ASX market in regards to that. In regards to uh, the spending story, um, this one has been a fascinating one to watch. So not interested really in the lag data. Again, it's going to be old news uh, when it is reported and and people will make what they make out of it in terms of the media reports. But the data that we're also looking at is the is the bank's leading reporting around what people are spending on. So let's go to the retail spending story. Um, and it, it has been, again, quite extraordinary. Just, just by way of example, retail spending during the month of, sorry, the week of May 22 is now 22.4% higher than the same time last year. With groceries and pharmacy spending is 23 0.9% higher year on year. Um, that's all good. Uh, it's not all good news, obviously. That you know, travel and also entertainment category is down a whopping 53% on this time last year. So what is that really telling us? It's potentially telling us we're not necessarily spending money on on going on holidays and potentially taking our money offshore. Um, we're keeping that money here, uh, and we're doing more around the house and spending uh, locally. And hopefully that will be. Also a good news story for our our domestic tourism um, and our travel bubble that we're looking to uh, to establish with New Zealand and Australia as well. So uh, it really is quite uh, quite fascinating. 
The recovery is clearly occurring um, if we look at the official uh, retail figures show that spending has collapsed in April, but we're basically back from that point of view. Now let's take a look at some of that data. So credit and debit card spending data from Commonwealth Bank and ANZ shows consumer spending has recovered so much so now that it's above where it was this time last year. So again, week ending May 22, personal spending on credit cards was up 2.3% according to ANZ's merchant data and up 4% according to CBA's data. Um, Context there, um, no one's using cash because potentially cash might have uh, the virus attached to it. So you've got to probably put some type of um, a weighting on the uh, the minimum amount of cash that's being used in the economy, but still extraordinary numbers. And, and we're seeing obviously that spending deviate as well. Uh, ANZ reported the surge in spending may reflect increases in card uses of cash, which is what we just talked about. Um, but yet regardless of that, ANZ observed retail spending is still stronger than we may have expected um, before the reopening of the economy. So, uh, and we haven't even seen the economy reopen yet. Um, as we record this this week, Victoria is still miles behind um, every other state in terms of reducing uh, their restrictions, um, and that is definitely having an economic impact. Um, so we really do need to wait another two or three or four weeks for Victoria to potentially catch up, um, because uh, we really don't, we aren't seeing the whole economy uh, in terms of what's happening around spending. So that's a, a positive news story there. Um, in terms of the, uh, the weekly index of consumer spending compiled by um, Alphabet um, uh, and also Ilion suggests that uh, consumer spending is now running at about 97% of its normal levels, which is just extraordinary. Um, which also points my attention to the comments that I made a couple of months back um, in regards to uh, the banks and their provisioning of doubtful debts. Um, one may argue why the bank shares have been doing so well of late is because remember, they are provisioning for doubtful debts. If those doubtful debts don't materialise, that's billions of dollars of profits that are going to be re-reported back into those banks. Um, so that could be one of the reasons why we saw the bank rally last week. Um, in terms of uh, employment, um, we got last week, the Australian Bureau of Statistics released the payroll jobs and wages index data. Uh, for the week between March 14 and May 2. Um, so it was quite an interesting period. And there's quite a, an interesting you know, sort of numbers here. Uh, jobs decreased by 7.3% and total wages paid decreased by 5.4%. Now that's not too bad considering all, thing, all things considered, right? Only a 5.4% decrease in money going out in the economy when we've got all this record stimulus that's also coming through from the governments. Uh, the four, fourth edition of the Bureau survey uh, measuring the impact of COVID-19 on businesses were released this time for the May 13 to May 22 week. 74% uh, of businesses said they have changed the way they operate. 72% said their revenues have declined as a result, understandably so. More than half, 55% of businesses said that they've received wage subsidies and 38% that they had accessed other forms of government support. Uh, we are included in that. 16% um, of business in the survey said they had deferred loan repayments and 11% said they'd sought additional funds to cover COVID-19. So not too bad at around 10%, so 90% uh, not looking for um, additional funds at the moment. Uh, the greater proportion of small businesses deferred loan payments, 16%, and there was a, a smaller portion received property rental deferral, so this is commercial rent, 18% compared to 20%, 27% for medium size and 32% for large size businesses. What is that telling us? That the big businesses are definitely asking for a rental reduction, um, not so much the small businesses. 71% of businesses, they expected social distancing measures to negatively impact uh, their operations in some way over the next couple of months. Makes complete sense. And 63% said trading restrictions would continue to impact and 50% said travel restrictions would dampen their operations. So um, we've got to get those borders opened. Overall businesses, um, we asked, required the business for the COVID-19, aside from the relaxation restrictions, 35% said they require uh, revival in demand, highlighting the critical need of confidence in the recovery. So 35% um, do want um, restrictions relaxed because it's critical for their recovery. And again, that makes perfect sense to me. So um, 
What do we want to measure and monitor? Not so much the unemployment rate, but hours worked. That is the, the real clear measure that's going to be the difference in terms of people returning to work and hopefully those businesses being in a position to provide that opportunity for them to do so. So um, still some challenges in regards to the employment story. Um, In terms of credit growth, um, owner-occupied housing was up um, and investment lending was down. So overall 0.2% increase month and still 3.6% up uh, year on year in terms of housing credit growth. Um, The owner-occupied was up 0.5 and is up 5.3%. So really there is, um, there's a lot of people out there um, who are owner occupiers looking at property at the moment and, and the investors are probably retreating a little bit where we saw them down negative two for the month and down negative 0.6 uh, for the year on year. Um, the, probably the most negative data uh, or most concerning data that uh, was released um, over the last few weeks has been the private credit expenditure, um, which is effectively the CapEx plans. Uh, it fell by 1.6% in the March quarter Um, and it's very fragile. So the business confidence area is quite fragile at the moment, understanding so they've got so much uncertainty out there around that. So um, we do expect um, that to be challenging. Uh, Where do we see the falls? 5.2% was really in the uh, sector, the uh, service sector, I should say, and it's been the largest quarterly decline in four and a half years. So services areas where you do need to have that interaction with people uh, have certainly been struggling, um, and that has been true. So um, it's also been an unfortunate time where businesses are doing their budgeting for their spending budgets for the next 12 months, and they're doing it right in the middle of this uh, COVID crisis. So that normally starts to take shape in March and April. So you can imagine all of those cautious people in boardrooms who are basically um, limiting the amount of CapEx plans for this year until they basically see a brighter future. So that is going to be problematic uh, and that is effectively what the Reserve Bank is saying. We do need to see small and medium-sized enterprises get access to credit uh, and believe in themselves to be able to uh, recover their businesses or create new businesses which will ultimately create the jobs for the rest of Australia. Um, In terms of consumer confidence, um, we're getting the weekly reading from ANZ, Roy Morgan, um, and last week the reading um, increased again. There's been eight straight weeks in which the reading has come off its historical lows. The reading was 92.7, so there's still a bit more pessimism than optimism. So we need to do some work on that as well. But um, certainly pointing in the right direction. And as um, hopefully the economy is open and we are a little bit more calm about the fact that there will be higher infection rates over the coming weeks and months, but manageable, um, we should basically be able to get back to some sort of covid normality. Um, that, is said, that, that being said, there's still a lot of media and, and, um, and sort of radio chat about um, the doomsdayers and, and what's happening. They still are getting clickbait and, uh, and certainly uh, helping the media outlets in terms of getting traffic. Not so much helping them get advertising dollars, I wouldn't have thought though, because um, obviously with those businesses not performing well, um, who's going to pay for the advertising? But that's just a little message to our media outlets. In terms of falling off a cliff, it's a, it's a silly assumption that by the end of September that we'll be falling off a cliff and I want to sort of prosecute my reasoning behind that. Firstly, it's silly, it's counterproductive and it's totally unnecessary. Um, for those who uh, ally their fears in this whole doomsday story, um, there's really no, no relevance to it at all because the governments are not going to let the economy, after all the great work that's been done, they're not going to let the economy slow down. But they've got a challenge here, right? You know, if they were to come out tomorrow and say, hey, everyone, yep, we've got this extra $60 billion. We're just going to basically put it back into the economy. You're all good for another six months. It breeds complacency. It breeds uh, inertia in terms of uh, businesses wanting to have a go or a uh, belief that the government should be, you know, basically helping everyone. So the 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 communication and the language and the signalling that you're getting right now is consistent with what a good government should do, which is basically saying, no, no, we want you to get on with it. We don't want you to be relying on us. Uh, We want you to basically get back to work, get back to doing what you were doing uh, safely, securely, um, and keeping under the uh, the COVID-19 measures. But that's what we want. Because the reality is, is if everyone gives up or a portion still give up or they have this inertia in the economy, 
that's not good for anyone. So the signaling is right for now. When they get closer to the time, they will have a look as part of their review in terms of the industries that are still being impacted. And those industries will be obviously accommodation and also hospitality and potentially a little bit of retail in there as well. And they will do targeted measured, measured uh, stimuluses or continuations of job seeker and job keeper packages appropriately. But what they also don't wanna do is create uh, a reliance on government welfare. Um, that is sensible too, in terms of trying to make sure that people realize that you don't just necessarily wanna stay at home, you wanna get out there and tr try and find employment to do that. So it is, a, it is a delicate act. The politics will be playing out in this particular space. But as we get closer to that sort of end of September deadline, we will start to see announcements made in regards to what stimulus programs will be, uh, will be available. And what that all showed then should mean that the fear mongering that is going on around that area should start to settle down. And I understand you're helping these people in terms of giving them a voice. I get that, that makes sense to me, but don't think it's not coming. It's definitely going to be targeted in the right area. Will it get everyone? Of course not. Like all of these things, there's not an unlimited pile of money. Um, it's going to be targeted where they can target it at. And there will unfortunately be people who don't get on with it. So what have I always said to people in this situation? Don't rely on the government, rely on yourself. Um, if it is to be, it's up to me. That's the messaging that I'd always say. Now, in terms of the property market and all oh, the property market's gonna fall off a cliff and you know the repayment holidays all stop and there's gonna be an absolute uh, mayhem in terms of the property market, just simply unsubstantiated, uh, no factual base in that at all. In fact, this week, most likely we're going to see a stimulus package released by the federal government, um, which is purely based on property. Uh, it's very clear that the construction industry has been impacted by COVID-19 and the confidence of buying properties. So you will see some form, we don't know the monetary value yet, but it's uh, going to be for um, the building of new constructed properties and brand new properties. Um, so it, it most likely will be a grant. Um, there's talk of that funding being around $20,000 of additional money. Uh, to get the economy uh, and the construction industry stimulated. So all of those people like, oh, I didn't, I didn't factor that into my assessments of what's going to happen. Well, you should have. I mean, ultimately, you're, it's naive to think that the economy isn't going to be supported by um, any type of stimulus in regards to the property market because it's too big to fail, um, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, the other thing that there, you know, let's talk about the second concern that they had it was around the imminent offering of these repayment pauses. Well, the reality is that the banks are also going to play their role in this. So how are they going to play the role? Well, it's really clear. APRA and also ASIC have cleared the way from a regulatory point of view, which will allow the banks to switch people from repayment pauses to interest only repayments or allow banks to negotiate depending on the hardship with each customer whether they'll extend the repayment pause um, or they'll get some type of minimum repayment program coming in. Whatever you can afford to pay, keep paying it because obviously the interest is capitalising. So we won't see a complete cutoff in regards to what the banks are going to do. Um, we are seeing record low interest rates. We are seeing affordability measures um, or, or repayment affordability better than it's been in a long time. So we're going to see just a managed process of extending out um, the support that's being given in the mortgage space. So please, for those people who keep talking about the property market's going to fall, over, fall off a cliff in September, and I say this also to sellers and buyers, um, if every buyer thinks that they're going to get a bargain come that time period, you are sorely mistaken. Think of everyone else who's basically doing exactly what you're thinking. All right, and times that by 10, times that by 100, times that by 1,000, and that's the amount of buyers who potentially are thinking that they might be getting out in the marketplace at that time. So um, it, it bodes well for a pretty positive story for the property market um, in the coming months and certainly into the new year. So in concluding this story around the mortgages, Westpac have already come out and confirmed that they will be offering the interest only. That will be matched by the other lenders. And again, they will be coming back to a case-by-case -case model 
where they will work out the best fit for you in terms of getting you back into a repayment program where it's appropriate. They will be not, uh, not forcing distress sales. Um, they've learned a lot over the last 20 to 30 plus years in terms of how to treat mortgage customers and default mortgagee people. So that's important to note. Um, let's turn our attentions now to um, the property market around the latest results. So CoreLogic released their home value index results for, for May, um, and it was, again, a really, really solid result considering all things considered. So um, the national index was down 0.4 of 1% over the month. Um, and in terms of that story, let's just go through them because five of the eight capital city regions accorded, recorded a fall. That obviously means that three went positive. So Sydney um, is down 0.4 for the month. For the quarter, it's still up 1.1%. Melbourne was down 0.9 for the month. Uh, for the quarter, it's up 0.8. And again, this is a product, unfortunately, of the restrictions uh, here in Victoria. Uh, Brisbane was negative 0.1 for the month, but positive 0.8 for the quarter. Adelaide was not only positive, positive 0.4, but it's positive 1.1 for the quarter. Perth, negative 0.6 for the month, but positive 0.1 for the quarter. Hobart, positive 0.8 and positive 0.5 for the quarter. Darwin, negative 1.6 for the month, but positive 2.1 for the quarter. And Canberra, positive 0.5 and also positive 1.2 for the quarter. So in terms of overall, as we were talking about before, capital cities, negative 0.5, but plus 0.5 for the quarter. And combined regional areas was flat for the month of uh, May, but 1.1% up for the quarter. Now, they are not numbers to be fearful of. Um, when we're, we were hearing all these doomsday stories of you know, negative 20, negative 30% crashes in the property market, the stimulus will obviously go a long way to building confidence in this particular market, which we anticipated would happen. And we definitely know um, that volumes are starting to increase. So uh, the number of transactions um, was up 18.5% for the month of May. So as I've been talking about, hashtag AusPropertyAlive. Um, we did want to get that message out there that the property market is open and we're starting to see that come through. Um, I refer to the, the head of research, Tim Lawless. Um, you know, we're, we're basically seeing um, that the downward trajectory of the house prices could be milder than first expected. So that's also a little hint from the person who has all the data at their finger, fingertips. Um, so I've got a message here and it's a consistent message. It's the same message that I had when people were saying, uh, here you are talking up the property market. Um, well, the reality is, is that the naysayers are either naive, they're too stubborn in their own biases, or they're just ill-informed in regards to what they know about the property market. So it's all well and good to get on the social media and have your voice, everyone has a voice, go for it, go for your life. But the property market, the residential property market was always gonna be protected and supported by these fundamental things. The first one is jobs are so important, employment are so important. It is the biggest employer, both directly and indirectly in our country. If you think about everything that has linkages back to residential property and a home, or a rental property, whether that be retail, whether that be utilities, whether that be services, house and contents, whatever that may look like, it is the biggest employer um, of people through construction and the like. So that's one thing. The government wasn't gonna let that, that industry die. Two, taxes. It's enormous. The amount of revenue, the billions, the tens of billions of dollars that come in through taxes, capital gains tax, stamp duty, GST on some sales, general development levies and duties, local council rates, tens of billions of dollars of tax receipts that are critical to the government coffers. They weren't gonna let the property prices fall and see those revenues deteriorate as well. So every dollar that they put in, they obviously are going to recoup in terms of those additional tax receipts that they're going to receive. So too big to fail. Number three, in terms of um, confidence, uh, it's, it, the property market and generally the great Australian dream of being in property has a lifestyle, living standards, and finally, what we've been talking about for a long time, 
a wealth effect. If people's property prices are stable or growing, they spend more money and that's good for the economy. So again, a message to those people who are thinking about buying property, um, if you want to do so, make sure you're in stable employment, make sure you understand the risk and rewards, but it's definitely going to be a, a, a positive story for the property because we're not falling off a cliff. There will continue to be resources and energy put into making sure that the property market survives and thrives because uh, owner-occupier appeal um, and 70% of the market is controlled by owner-occupiers. So please always remember that for those people who are learning about why property prices don't go down in these times. Um, in terms of my final observation, um, I do absolutely want to acknowledge um, that there are people still doing it tough in the economy. Um, and, you know, that's fair enough. And, I, and, I, and my heart goes out to those people who are doing it tough. Um, but I also think right now um, we have definitely turned a corner and there should be reason for cautious optimism. Um, that's what everyone wants to see. The governor of the Reserve Bank, business confidence needs to return. Uh, we need to be well led. Uh, we need to see our politicians doing the right thing. Um, you know, a whack to the Liberal Party in terms of their immigration policy and their students, international students policy. I'll come back to that next week. Um, but it's fair to say that we're moving more towards um, what the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank says, a squeezed U recovery, um, where we, we could see as much as 85% of the economy returning to some level of normality. Um, whilst that said, we realise that the final mile um, is going to be difficult. Um, that will be challenging to get back to that final level um, whilst we still have uh, a virus um, out there in the community, which is very deadly and very dangerous. So um, be mindful that we will, we will not get back to um, the way things were until such time as we have a vaccine or treatment program for that. Be mindful also that the governments will continue to have targeted spending. Um, so uh, the job keeper package um, will eventually go back to some form of, um, of assistance, probably not at the same levels that it is, but an adjustment back to, to the new start allowance of some description because they want to encourage people to get into work. Um, in terms of JobKeeper, a lot more targeted um, than what it has been for these first six months of the stimulus that they put out there. Um, expect to see the banks continue to in, continuing to support their customers. The banks don't want a profiteer out of being forced selling people's homes. They don't want to see the devastation that that does to those family units in terms of losing their great Australian dream. So they'll continue to keep working beyond the current environment and continue to keep giving the borrower plenty of options in terms of how they move forward. Um, with all of that said, um, you know, reminding you that there's still a high probability that we will see uh, increases in COVID-19 cases as we move um, to more mingling and more, uh, more people mo mobile. So don't panic when you see those numbers starting to increase um, and, you know, as Dr Lowe stated, it's all about keeping a level head and getting that confidence so we can move forward in regards to that. So um, there is a lot more to be optimistic about right now in Australia than there has been over the last few months. Um, we are absolutely blessed to be living in this great nation um, where we have our freedoms, um, we have a standard of living, a health system, a social net that catches almost everyone at the moment. Um, so it's really, really powerful. The other point I want to make is don't forget, even though there's money flowing into households um, or not necessarily on spending, we are seeing some of it, but we do know that there is money flowing into those households. So that's hitting their balance sheet. If they're not spending it, it's reducing their debt levels and we expect to see um, household savings improving as well. So there's a lot to be um, really, really positive about in regards to, um, to this story. So with that in mind, um, until next month, remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it.